are White's boots the best boots made in the United States? And how can a boot be worth $650? Well, we're going to find out by cutting this boot in half, taking the materials and testing them to see what it's made of and see if it's worth the money and see if White's boots are worth the hype. So what is this particular boot? Well, this is the Drifter boot that I designed with White's as a collaboration. And if you want a full 30 minute deep dive into the whole design process and every little element that we chose, because we basically picked and pulled different elements from all the different boots to design this specific boot. That was released yesterday on the Rose Anvil 2 channel, I'll put a link below. But for a quick breakdown of what this boot was supposed to be and the idea behind it, I wanted a Western inspired boot that you could work in, play in, and, and look good in. But I also wanted a boot that was a little more subtle than a full on cowboy boot or a Packer boot that anyone could wear with any outfit, with any occasion, and be comfortable doing it. I just wanted it to be the most versatile boot you could own and if you had to live in one boot for the rest of your life this would be it and that goal of the versatility is why we added in the knife pocket kit and the little stash pocket that's along with that kit that you can sew on and choose where you place it and what side of the boot to make it the most versatile boot you can own and they're only making 200 of this specific boot so if you want a pair of these be sure to check out the link in the description if they're sold out already i apologize uh, that's as many as I could get whites to do, but we'll probably be doing more collabs down the road on this similar platform, just with different colors and everything. So sign up to the limited edition email list below. And I'll also put some links to some, some similar boots built in the same way, just not this exact makeup. So for a quick history of the White Boots Company, it was, it's got a pretty long history to be honest. It started in 1853 with Edward White, who established a one-man shoe shop in Connecticut. 1880, John White, who was Edward's son, who he taught boot making, followed that opportunity to the Shenandoah Valley and it was the first time loggers and miners were introduced to White's boots. And then from 1889 to 1900, around that decade, John White and his son Otto, who's an important person in this whole story, moved west and settled in Warden, Ward, Wardner, <laughs> Wardner, Idaho, the most Idaho name ever. And Otto was a super ambitious guy and really wanted to own and grow this boot company. And so in 1910, Otto grew the company from a one-man shop to the White's Shoe Company and accidentally burned down the building with a formaldehyde candle, but that didn't stop the ambition of Otto. So in 1915, they relocated to Spokane, Washington, where they still are today, over 100 years later. And then from 1915 onward, he really started to establish it as a popular boot for loggers, for construction workers, wildland firefighters, and anyone that was doing a really hard manual labor job. It started establishing the White's brand with those people. And then in 1926, the Arch Ease was trademarked. And that's a big part of what they built their brand around is the Arch Ease Last. It's not even on their box. There it is. Arch Ease. And then from the 1920s and 1930s when they released a big line of boots that a lot of them are still around today with the Lineman, the Packer, Oxford, Simi Dress, the Modern Cruiser, all started way back in the 20s and 30s. And then by 1930, the world famous 4811 last was developed, the same last that this boot is built on and, and the last that would make one of White's most popular boots, the Smoke Jumper. And the Smoke Jumper was a firefighting boot that was developed and released in 1939 and worn by Francis Lufkin. And it was such a popular boot with the loggers, firefighters, forest service guys that they would spend an entire week's worth of pay on a pair of boots. And then in 1963, a new version of the Smoke Jumper was released and it was so popular that it took this brand from a popular brand in the Pacific Northwest and grew it to a popularity across not only North America, but the entire world. And then unfortunately in 1972, Otto White dies, but the brand continued onward. And then in 2014, White's was bought by the Lacrosse Footwear Company, who also owns Danner and a bunch of these other brands. And they're owned by the Tokyo-based ABC Mart. And then from 2014 onward, they continue to make the same boots in the same way they did for over 100 years. And they've continued to grow their line and, and expand their marketing to a point where now White's is a really well-known brand across the world when it comes to the highest quality boots. And a lot of these Pacific Northwest brands can trace their lineage all the way back to Otto White and all the way back to his granddad. So it's just this really interesting story that we've seen repeated across a lot of these boot companies that start off with a one-man shop and over 100 years later they're still around making some of the best boots in the world. So now I'll start going through all the details of this boot starting with the leather. So this leather is their Red Dog leather and it's tanned by the American Tannery Seidel and it's three millimeters thick. So you're up in that really thick thickness that you see in these high-end work boots because most leathers are around 1.5 to 2 millimeters thick and here's a list of some of the other work boots to show you how thick this actually is and this is one of their work boot leathers that I feel like people don't fully appreciate because a lot of people are drawn towards the more fancy boots with lots of pull-up like Chrome XLs and Cordovan because of 
certain characteristics, but, and people sleep on some of these work leathers because this red dog leather has some really unique characteristics that's, that's best explained after we grade this leather. So, so we put the macro lens on the cross section to see how much grain there was in there. And as you can see, there's a huge slab of grain. So it's most likely a full grain leather. We also checked to see if it was a natural leather or, or if it had a fake print embossed into it. So once again, we put the macro lens on it and you can see that it has the natural pores and there's no fake print embossed into it. We also burned the leather to see if it had a plastic coating on top. And as you can see, it didn't melt. It just burn so we know it's there's no plastic but it does have a coating of a red pigment on top and if you look at the cross section you can see that the inside of the leather is a lighter red color that's dyed all the way through the core so i would say this is pretty clearly an a grade leather and the darker red pigment on top with the lighter red core throughout the cross section of the leather is really what makes this leather unique to me and why I love it so much is because once you start really beating this leather up that that red pigment starts to wear off and that lighter red core starts to show through and you get a really cool two-toning patina look that is really unique to how you wear your own boots for example I have two pairs of these boots. One pair was the first prototype that I really babied. I, I tried not to scuff them up too much. I still wore them a lot, but I was somewhat conscious of how much I was beating them up. And as you can see, it's a nice deep red color that has some nice variation. It looks really clean and classy. And then this pair is the pair that I just beat to death over the spring and summer and early fall. I took them bear hunting, horse riding, uh, I did some construction work in them. I took them line dancing. I dressed them up for fancy dates. I took them to work. I rode motorcycles in them. I went to some concerts. I went to some. Uh, I went to amusement park in these boots. So basically, anywhere I could justify wearing boots, I did. Probably broke a couple toes in a mosh pit. But that's why I love this leather because you get some really good wear and tear, and it just makes the boots look better. Or you can keep them pristine and make them look really nice. So they get some really unique character and like they break into your own foot and how you use them and what you're using them for. The boots kind of tell the story as, as cliche as that is, but it's a really cool leather. One thing that we don't talk a lot about on this channel is the last that these boots are built on. And if you don't know what a last is, a last is basically a hard plastic foot shape that the boot is built around to give it its particular toe profile and shape and arch of the boot. And the way most cheaper boots are made is they have a machine that grabs the leather and automatically stretches the leather around the last, shaping the form of the boot. But these White's boots, they still do it in the same way they've been doing for over a century, and that's all by hand. They take these lasting pliers and they grab the multiple layers of leather and pry it around the last, wrong way, pry it around the last, and then tack in nails to hold it in place instead of a machine that does it automatically. And that is not an easy job. You have to be made of steel to do this for 40 hours a week. And when I went up to the White's facility and we walked around and saw the whole process, we met a bunch of people making these boots, and I'll tell you what, I have not felt a more firm handshake than the guys that make these boots. I was, I was a little bit afraid by the end of the tour my hand would be hamburger because those guys because think about it you're taking you're prying with pliers all day every day so the last that this boot is built on is the 4811 last and that's that last we talked about in the history segment that really put whites on the map for work boots with their world famous smoke jumper for all the firefighters and it's white says it's their most popular last but for some reason it's just not used very much in casual boots so i, I think it's one of the most underused and underappreciated lasts for casual boots. And I like this last because it has it has that really high arch and it doesn't have a super pointy toe like some of the other lasts or like a Packer boot or even a cowboy boot. It has a more square, roomier toe box, which I love. So it's this really nice hybrid last that gives you some attributes of like a Western boot with a work boot with the support of a, a high-end handmade boot. It's, uh, it's, it's my favorite White's last. And then to the craziest part of this boot and the most unique part of this boot is the construction. And I've never seen anyone else make a boot like this until I made this video. I don't know how I missed how White's makes boots being my career is reviewing boots, but somehow I missed it. And this construction is, it's like a combination of a stitch down construction and a Goodyear well. It's like a stitch down on steroids. Because in a regular stitch down boot, the upper is flared out and stitched down through the midsole and the outsole. Well, White's takes it the extra mile by sewing on an additional strip of leather, similar to a Goodyear welt, that is sewn on and rolled over and then rapid stitched like a regular stitch down boot. But that's not really the, the crazy aspect of it. The, the really wild thing is it's all done by hand. Every single one of these stitches that goes through all those layers to the inside sewing the, the, all those layers together is all done by hand. And not just like hand done on a sewing machine. The people that make these boots, they take an awl 
and they poke it through all those layers by hand. They take a needle and thread, poke it through all those layers by hand, and then they tighten all those layers together by hand. So why would whites do it like this? Well, because the welt strip is hiding a little stitch that you can't see from the outside and that you can't feel from the inside. And that little hidden stitch sews through that welt stitch, through the upper, through the lining, and all the way through that really thick slab of uh, the leather insole, holding all those layers together. Then that welt strip is rolled over and then sewn down through the upper through the midsole and through the outsole like a traditional stitch down boot. They call it their hand sewn stitch down, which almost doesn't give it enough credit. It's it's like a Goodyear storm welted stitch down was maybe how I understand it. And, it. and it combines the best attributes of a Goodyear welt and a stitch down. It fixes the problems of both to combine it to make a, a somehow a, a construction that I missed somewhere along the line. And after seeing those guys do that and really understanding how this construction is made, I have so much respect for those guys. They they are single-handedly keeping a hundred plus year tradition alive by making boots this way. You, you really can't look at a pair of hand-sewn whites the same after seeing and understanding the skill and the strength it takes to make these boots. Because they're, they're as far as I know, the only ones doing it at this scale in the United States. And they could easily just move to a full stitch down boot because it's faster, it's easier, and it's more affordable. But whites and the guys that make these boots are keeping this tradition alive. So now we know how much work and time and energy and blood, sweat and tears go into every single one of these boots. Now we're gonna cut one in half, but I think it'll be worth it because the, of the knowledge we gained through it and so that you guys can fully see what I'm attempting to describe. So let's cut them in half. Okay, we got them cut in half, and this is up there with the most painful boots that I've ever had to cut in half, especially since this pair is well broken in and perfectly fit me. But whatever, part of the job. Let's see what's inside. So this is the very first time I've seen a boot with the lining leather matching the quality of the upper leather. You know, because the upper leather is an A-grade leather, and usually on the lining of boots, they'll use a suede or a cheaper leather just to save a little bit of money because no one's gonna see it. This is another slab of red dog leather, just thinner. And this lining leather alone is better than half the boots that we re reviewed on the channel. And I like that you can see how many nails go into the construction of this boot. You know, all these layers are held together with glue and nails, and those nails clinch over to, to not just bind them together, but actually hook into the leather to hold them tight. And another really unique thing that Whites does is in between each layer of this leather is a layer of canvas. Because when, when it's just leather on leather, a lot of times over, over once you've got them broken in, they start to rub against each other and they start to squeak. Well, this canvas layer prevents that from happening. Just look at all this leather. Starting at the top, just look how even the, even the sock liner is pretty thick. And then you've got that full leather insole, that little wedge of leather for the arch support, a really thick leather shank, a, a pretty thick leather midsole, and then a full leather heel stack. And the advantage of this much leather is that it compresses the shape of your foot like a custom molded insole does. And it's significantly more durable than foam or fiberboard or basically any other material used in cheaper boots. Leather balances the flexibility, durability, breathability, Sweat, sweat, sweat absorbability and longevity better than pretty much any other material. It's almost like nature had millions of years to develop the perfect 
material to wrap animals in. So that's why the oldest pair of shoes ever found in history were made of leather and the best shoes made today are made of leather. But this style of construction and all this leather isn't without fault. There are some negative with, with this much leather and this type of construction because they are a beast to break in. It is not easy. It takes weeks, if not months, to break these on, in, into your feet. And this much leather is a lot harder underfoot than a lot of these foam boots. Because of how much labor goes into these, they are not cheap. They're three times the price of most work boots and they're really heavy. And because they're all handmade, the lead times are pretty long. You have to wait several weeks to get a pair of these boots. So these boots aren't perfect and there are some considerations and trade-offs you need to consider when you're buying a pair of these traditionally made boots. And then finally to the three big questions we asked in the intro, are whites the best boots made in the United States? To me, I, I think they are. And maybe there's some handmade guys making them in lower quantities, for, but for a company making this many boots, it's hard to dispute that they're not the best in the, in the entire United States. And there is a point of diminishing return at a certain point, but a diminishing return is still a return. And when you're trying to identify which is the best boot, those little returns and those little things matter to put it over the edge to make it the best boot. But are they worth the hype? If you're looking at it for what it is, I honestly don't think there's enough hype around their, their hands on stitch down boots because I review boots for a living and I somehow missed it and didn't fully understand and appreciate this style of construction. But if you consider hype to be more value centered, you can make an argument that three pairs of a normal work boots are gonna be more comfortable, last longer, and be a better option than one pair of $650 boots. So are these boots worth $650, three times the price of most work boots? If you're looking at this boot, I'm, I'm honestly surprised they're not in that $800 to $1,000 price range. And if I'm being honest with, with all the materials and all the labor that goes into them, it's hard to argue that they are not worth $650. So if you're going for value, you might value that more, but there's certain attributes with a pair of handmade boots that you might value over the cheaper boots, like the arch support and all the leather and, and all the different attributes we've talked about. So in that way, I still think they're worth the hype, and, and but also maybe they're just a little bit overhyped. There is a lot of bold claims and a lot of fanboys out there about these Pacific Northwest handmade boots when I honestly think both options are a viable option. So I think they're underhyped and I think they're also a little overhyped to some degree, but it's hard to dispute that these, these are one of the best, if not the best boots made in America. So let me know what you guys think. And if you want a pair of these, check out the links below. Obviously there's only 200 pairs of these available, but I'll put links to similar boots. So you have more options if these are sold out by the time you're watching this. And thanks so much for your support. It's what allows me to cut apart these expensive boots and, and show you exactly what you're spending your hard earned money on. And your support is what allows me to do these collaborations to make my dream boots and really get into the nitty gritty of boot design and construction and it's so much fun. So thank you guys. See ya.